Almost 2,000 years ago, a group of people in feudal Japan found themselves pushed further and further away from the mainstream of society, as they refused to give up their spiritual beliefs to the imposed conformity of the ruling class. The ruling power made it illegal for common people to carry or own the deadliest weapon of the time, a finely edged sword. So these people had to learn to defend themselves in different ways to walk the path of their own chosen desire and to blend in so as not to attract attention. They learned survival skills so unsurpassed that the name Ninja became feared by all who heard it. But the primary concern, then as now, was to live and to let live in peace and harmony so that all mankind can reach their own levels of heightened enlightenment. This black belt home study course is designed to set you on the path. Nenpo will give you the power to overcome life's obstacles by coming out on top. And the skills you will learn in this series will give you the flexibility to roll with life's everyday punches, the courage to climb above life's obstacles. Only your own discipline and perseverance can carry you through to the finish. Your goal of receiving a black belt and all that it stands for. And view life from a different perspective from that uncluttered height. And what the insights that you've gained will help you to slice through all the things that are holding you back from being all that you can be. You may find that instead of being caught up in fights that don't concern you, you can just hang out and observe. Unless, of course, you need to take action, and then who knows? You may be so dazzling they don't even know what hit them. We will study from the traditional schools of Kumugakureru, Kotoru, Tagakureru, Gyokushinru, Gikanru, Gyokuru, Tagagi Yoshinru, Shinden Fururu, Kuki Shinden Rus of Grandmaster Masaaki Hatsumi of the Bujinkan system. I am proud to present this black belt home study course. All right, you've made it to second cue. The second cue techniques that we're first going to study are taijutsu skills of suwari gata. Suwari gata are skills of practicing while you yourself or you and your opponent are on the ground. We're going to begin these from a seiza position. The seiza position with the toes up is actually from Tagagi Yoshin Ryu, which a lot of suwari gata are ground skills come from. So as I'm sitting here, as the first beginning drills, move up just a little closer. As this person comes with an attack, I want to learn just to move my attacker offline. Alternating the left side and the right side. So I'm just going offline. It can even be a punch coming in my face. I'm just learning to move this offline. So here, just moving it over. We progress to doing several of the kind of techniques that we naturally do, like different kinds of wrist twists or grabs. Coming here, just taking the wrist, turn, and going down. Make sure that you learn to practice these on each side of the body. Comes out, naturally taking the wrist, turning down. Make sure that you do only use as much energy as necessary in doing these movements. Just natural and down. You also may want to switch sides doing another kind of technique. You also want to make sure that you do more advanced techniques such as get in here and doing mushidori. Again, doing it on both sides of the body. I'm entering inside. Even though this drill makes me use, particularly the way that I'm doing it at the moment, makes me use my arms more, I'm learning to use and shift my upper body. I can do these from the ground as the person comes up and step up myself, turning, twisting my body, straightening it in, taking this person down.
turning and controlling. Make sure you practice like a multi gyaku and a gyaku. Maybe switching. Turn. Down. You also can do Ganteke Nage. It comes shifting in, shifting your foot inside. Actually, you can come up that side. You also want to learn to practice your kicking skills. Just kicking into the body. Once more. Just notice that I'm just going straight to my attacker. You also, as the person comes up, grab the hold with both hands. Also, as the person comes up and grabs, that you want to be able to practice your rolling over skills, controlling your opponent. That you want to be able to practice your rolling over skills, controlling your opponent. all kinds of different variations. <laughs> Techniques of Suarigata. Now we're going to work on the Taihen Jutsu skills of second Q. We're going to begin this with kuten, or forward handsprings. Now what you want to do with these is sort of jump upwards and downwards. And as you do that, you want to be able to land with enough force that gives you enough spring to push yourself over. You want to be able to reach this point in your arm so that you can have enough spring to push yourself into standing position. Now, some of you are probably wondering, well, how do I do this? How do I, as a beginner, just throw myself into the ground and spring into a handspring? Well, one of the things you want to start with is learning how to stand on your hands. One important aspect of standing on your hands is where you're looking, where your head is. You want to be facing in the same direction as your upper body is facing, or forwards. Some people have this habit of arching their back, and what that does, it changes the balance because it changes the weight distribution in the body. They'll do this sort of thing here, where they're arching their back. It's a bad habit. If you learn how to stand on your hands in that manner, you're not going to learn how to properly do a forward handspring. If I'm facing this way, as I bend over, I want my head facing in that direction. I want my back straight. So, throwing yourself onto the ground in that manner and springing off, flipping over. Kuten, forward hands. Moving along with Dakin Tai Jitsu skills, we're going to start this off with Sokiken, or knee strikes. With the knee strike, you want to strike primarily with this part of the knee here. Say an attacker comes in with a punch. You want to evade, hit with this part of the knee. Once more. It's a bit risky if you start trying to hit with this part of the knee, you've got to pick your targets well. If he comes in, one good way of doing this is to invade and strike his knee with this portion of the knee here. <coughs> Holding on to his foot at the bottom here. Striking with this part of the knee. Once more. Here. Once he's down, you can use the same portion of the knee in this manner. 
It's a dangerous thing to do because of the risk of doing damage to your own kneecap. So you've got to choose your targets carefully. You don't want to hit anything that's got too much bone jutting out of it. One more time. Here, dropping in, taking him down, picking targets such as the thigh, maybe, or the chest, or the rib cage. Soaky can. Knee strikes. The next Dokken Taijutsu technique is Shuki Ken, or elbow strike. Striking with various points of the elbow. The front portion here, the very tip, and even the back portion of the elbow. Depending on what part of the opponent you're going to strike and what, how much damage you want to do to the opponent. Here, I'll demonstrate a couple of basic techniques using the elbow strike against an opponent. The partner comes in with a punch. You can simply just move a little bit to the inside, raising your elbow here to the face. Also moving to the outside from the same type of punch. The opponent comes in just a little bit to the side, attacking into his arm, and right into the back of his joint with the front of my elbow. Here. Other various ways of striking with the elbow are from a punch, again moving slightly to the inside and raising the elbow very carefully in this technique up under the chin. From here you can drive it down. Also striking not only to just the upper body, but to the lower body. If the opponent punches at me again, they will just move off to the side a little bit. Drop my body down with my elbow right onto this thigh. Shuki Kin, elbow strike. Continuing in the Dak and Tai Jitsu tradition, we have Hapaken, or palm strike, using both hands, the heel of the palm, against an opponent's temples, against their ears, causing a ringing in the ears, or up against their chin in a one-two punch. Here against the ears. Here, to the temples. Here, under the chin. Hopakin, palm strikes. The next aspects of the Dokken Tai Jitsu are those of Kopo Jitsu, bone attacks. We're going to begin just a basic phase of that. The show with the new game. As the person punches, in our system, the person's doing some kind of a block. I want to take and work on attacking the small bones in here. It's much better, instead of blocking where I have meat to meat, that I, I actually take and might as well attack bones, bones, small bones in the base here, bones here, from striking on this arm, I strike the outside bone, small bones in the hand, bone that stick out here, any part of the bones. Later on you can actually learn to break bones, but that's only if it's absolutely necessary. As a person comes with a ski, and our system is where we're teaching to fall back at a 45 degree angle, that I'll come up here and I'll strike with my knuckles doing this kind of rotation, so I'm hitting with one and then hitting with two. I'll do this rotation, hit once and hit twice. You'll actually can also, besides attacking bones, will attack nerves in here. They'll actually make his hand just open up and not want to work for several minutes. If the bone is impacted more than once, it could shatter the bone. If a person that has a knife or something that's going to really harm you, then you may want to attack this bone with ferocious intensity. So I may be striking here, punching again, attacking, coming down into that same target. The more times that I hit the same place or the same target is going to cause this damage. You don't have to practice these with real intensity. You can practice these in a very light manner where it's just hitting, practicing these Dokken Taijutsu or inside maybe attacking into the bones, coming back out, attacking to the other side, punching, practice punching drills. So you're punching into these with your body. 
learning to do multiple attacks. If more than one punch is coming, I can be hitting here. So it's coming, clearing on these bones. The other one's coming, just practicing bone attacks. The more that I hit into the same target, the more damage that I'm going to do to that particular piece or bone. The beginning idea of bone attacks, because those nerves are running right alongside the bones and hitting that. We'll move on to some Koji Jitsu, which is muscle things and the next forms of first cue in the Koji Jitsu points of first cue Dokken Tai Jitsu. So that's some aspects of bone attacking. You can attack any part of the entire body or any bone in the body with that same kind of process. The next part of our Dokken Tai Jitsu is Shishin Ken, or needle finger strike, striking with the small finger. In this technique, you want to have your little finger straight and supported next to the other fingers and by the thumb, this way. So my thumb will come across and support this little finger, keep it in place. Now I'll demonstrate some basic techniques using Shishin Ken. If the opponent comes up and maybe grabs you, from a grab, you can apply Shishin Ken here. We're just underneath the jaw, striking. Striking into the eye, into the nose, the mouth, the ear, hooking just behind the ear. You can also strike right into the throat. From a punch, the opponent punches. You simply just evade away. Striking here. You can also strike into the groin and then into the face. Shishin Kin, needle finger strike. The next form of Dakin Tai Jitsu that I'm going to demonstrate is Tai Ken, or using the whole body as a weapon. You want to think about your entire body, your entire being as the weapon, versus just parts and pieces of it. Yes, I can use my little finger, I can use my fists, I can use my elbows in different kinds of ways, I can use my knees as to strike, but I want to be able to use my entire body as a weapon also, because it's really my body that are delivering these strikes. So as I have my attackers coming after me, coming at me in any kind of way, it's just losing from the body itself. I don't have to punch with anything to take my opponent down. It's the same thing if they're punching and I'm just moving my entire body in and through. Now this particular technique is not where I'm using my knee or my, le my leg specifically, but my entire body. I can also go under these attacks and just come through using my body. If a person is, say, throwing some kind of a kick at me or whatever, I move my body out of the way, move my entire body to take him down. More. You come this way. Even though I had my hand up by his face, I didn't really punch. I just allowed him this for him to run into this as I'm just walking through with my body. Not striking with my hand, using my entire body. Because the person may come with a punch, the same thing if I have this fist out, it's like a battering ram. So it's my body that's using as the weapon, not as my fist. Once more, because it just here is <laughs> Once more, those are the aspects of Tai Ken, or using your entire body with your Dokken Tai Jitsu skills. Remember, it's all of you that you're using in balance. It's very, very, very important by the time you reach second Q to learn to use all of yourself to, to deliver any kind of attack or any kind of thing that you do. Standing erect, keeping yourself in balance, holding that energy, holding that presence. By this time, you should be able to be very, very efficient in holding the energies in your body and directing your mind, your spirit, and your consciousness. And doing that in a way that starts refining into a full integration. Because by the time you're a black belt, that's what I want to see on your test, that you can hold that kind of composure and understand the principles and, and use them with all of yourself. 
Next, we're going to work on Shimewaza Gokata, or five forms of strangulation. We're going to begin this with Honjime. In Honjime, what I do is I grab him here. My left hand comes over, and as I pull this down, pull with my left hand, my right hand goes into his throat. I can use my thumb with this, or kopoken, to get into some vital points in the throat area. Here. Once more, left hand grabs the lapel. The right hand crosses over and also grabs the lapel. I'm pulling down so that the fabric of the gi pulls my left, pulls my right hand into his throat. Honjime. The next Shimiwata choking technique is Gyakujime, or reverse choke. From here, similar to Honjime, where hands grab this way, one hand grabs up, the other hand grabs with your thumb pointing down. So it's a reverse manner. Almost the same kind of choke, except one hand's down, pulling across this way. You can choke the opponent with just, if they have some type of heavy uh, coat or uniform, heavy shirt, they can be choked strictly with just that, or I can use my hand to pull across into the neck this way. Gyakujime. <coughs> the next technique we'll be doing is Sankakujime, or three-sided choke. This choke is done from behind. So, what I'd want to do, especially if the opponent is taller than me, is take him a little bit lower. This arm comes around the front, and this one here. <coughs> so I have my right hand behind his neck, my left hand comes over, my right hand grabs a hold of my sleeve. My left hand grabs either his shirt, <coughs> or can also grab my forearm. <coughs> Once more from a different angle. <coughs> now with this choke, you can either be dragging your forearm into his larynx, <coughs> or reaching all the way around and choking him out using your bicep against one side of the neck and your forearm against the other side of the neck here. <coughs> This will cut off the circulation to his brain and not do damage to his larynx here. <coughs> this is San Kaku Jime. The next form of Shimewaza choking techniques we're going to introduce is Dojime, or entire body choking technique. The first basic technique we're going to demonstrate in Dojime was attack from the behind or choke from behind, we're going to use our entire arm this way, using our thumb knuckle into the center of the body, squeezing in this way. Instead of just simply grabbing the opponent, this also <coughs> works, but not as effective as if you use a thumb knuckle, driving that in and down. Also, Dojime, using the entire body, using the arms, the legs, everything, to grab hold of and choke. The whole body choke my opponent. Also, if I have my opponent down onto the ground already, just using my body here, down onto the center of his chest, choke. You can plant your foot underneath, underneath of his back this way, and just shift this forward. That chokes your opponent as well. These are some of the basic aspects of dojime, or body choke technique. The next form of Dr. Tai Jitsu is Itamejime, which is any kind of choking, grabbing, constricting. It doesn't have to be on the neck. It can also be on the arms, the body, legs, all kinds of different positions. Anything that's striking, choking, and constricting that causes pain. So, as a person may be coming up even trying to grab a hold of me, I may move away from this. I can use this 
one hand. <coughs> they could come up, any kind of attack, move them out of the way, coming from behind, having the fingers in here, grabbing into the throat. Taking my thumbs, pressing my thumbs into the back base of the neck. Constricting choke. It could be this way. Fingers in here. Constricting. It can also be if I could just take and grab a hold of the arm itself and choke and strangle just the arm muscle. Kicking type attacks. Person comes in, just ah, 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 strength, ah, just the leg and the tense muscles. You also can take and just ah, the toes. Ah, anything that causes strangulation on any part or piece of the body, skin, organs, uh, pressure points, blood veins, constriction of air. Itami jimei. Be careful on these techniques. They are very powerful, and they are very painful. First weapon of second cue is the shako, which are hand claws. These claws were used for blocking swords. They were used for grappling an opponent, for clawing, for grabbing a hold of things, for climbing up things like up trees, scaling walls. Against an opponent, just to show you a few ideas, You'll want to practice with rubber ones. But to give you a couple ideas on what's possible, is that I would maybe be able to rake across the face, do those same kind of choking skills. Or I would come in, do grabbing a hold. You can imagine what these would be with actual claws, whether it be grabbing, ripping in, raking across a person's face or into the neck. It would be an automatic, not very good situation for the attacker. It could also be against any kind of punch attack or it could be just raking across all the way down a person's arms, coming into the face, coming back into the throat, attacking down into the body, just raking, clawing, any, anything in my way. Against a sword attack, the basic form of a person comes from a Daijodan attack, but I may just catch this and block with the sword itself. I can catch the sword in the claws and actually turn the blade out of the opponent and actually cut him with the blade. I could also take it back into my hands and finish off my opponent. First is actually using actual metal ones. You always want to practice with a simulated weapon as I've stated before. These weapons are very, very dangerous. They do make rubber claws that you can get. Even these can be very devastating on a person's face, so you need to be very, very careful with them. Just something to practice with. It's something to use from Tagakure Ru in our system. So be very, very careful. It's the same kind of aspects of using your hand or your basic hand claws of the shako. These are called shuko. Second cue, the aspects of using that of the katana are ones of drawing skills and cutting skills. But before that you have the ability to learn how to do that, you first need to learn how to take and put the sword and the scabbard into your belt. And you begin by taking your thumb into the left side, holding your thumb out to pull the belt a little away from the body. As you hold the sword out in your right hand, making sure that your knuckle is on the suba, holding the sword in. You begin by placing the sword into the belt itself, crossing over the side of the body, releasing your left hand, sliding it up with your thumb, pulling it down in, tight inside of your belt, still holding with the thumb. Primary reason for holding the thumb is that this was a sign or is a symbol in Japan in ancient times, in samurai, that if this sword was broke at all, that meant that it was time for a battle or for someone else to use their sword against you. 
there are some little tricks to be able to break the sword loose because the sword should be somewhat tight here. To break this loose, you can take and use your thumb by pushing it just barely loose first. You can also take your little finger and push it open with your little finger. It slides open. This gives you just that extra little edge in doing a sword draw. The thumb is on, as you step back in, an Ichimonji no Kamai, for a basic drawing posture. That as I draw, and my right hand comes over, I will take and turn the blade and rotate it to the side. Because in our system, the blade edge is down. So on the draw, I will rotate this as the blade comes out. Putting the blade back in, I still leave the scabbard in this turn position. I create a little groove with my fingers. You can learn to do this without it by sliding it along, but this takes a little bit of practice. So in the very beginning, because you're taking the back of the edge of the blade, the non-sharpened edge of the blade, and slide it along the edge, opening edge of the scabbard. You take these two fingers, like this little guardrail here, and they slide in the guardrail, sliding along the scabbard until you get to the tip, which goes in its hole, slides down, and returns in, putting the thumb to keep it and hold it in place. The very basic aspect of putting the sword back. This you'll need to practice many, many times so it becomes very easy and very proficient for you. Once again, watching just a full draw, that if I fall back into Ichimonji no Kamai, that I maybe first have my hand out in a fist and shows that I'm, I'm ready to do a sword battle, but yet I'm not actually starting the battle because I'm holding my thumb on the suba, holding the blade still in place. It shows that I'm ready, but I'm not actually fighting yet. It wouldn't be to the moment that I reached out or that I broke this loose would it give a signal for the fight actually to totally begin. There are several ideas on drawing the sword from this position. One is that I can actually come out and help a little bit by bringing the scabbard all the way out with my left hand. Just to the point my left hand is in full length. So that as I draw back, I've already and sheath the sword, or most all of it, so it's very easy for me to continue with this out and doing a cut. Sliding back again, I also could help out by coming back, pulling back depending on the position, and it really depends on the timing. You also want to be able to stand in natural Susanna is that as you're falling back, if you're holding on to the sword with your right hand, as you step back, it comes out of the scabbard naturally. Standing here, it's already almost all the way out. Of course, I would turn it to the side as I do this draw. I almost have the sword all the way out of the scabbard. It's very easy for me to move back and it naturally comes out for me to do some kind of strike. Sliding back in, back in place. That is the first basic draw. Once more, done just all the way through, but I would just come back into a position, turn, cut. That is the basic draw. If I was in a tight space, maybe not enough room as far for the ceiling for me to, <coughs> to drill a sword all the way out, or not a wide enough hall, but I may first need to take a step, pulling my hand down, pulling the blade out so that I'm in a low position to be able to move to do some kind of attack. Once more, if I'm here dropping down, A trick draw that I learned that I think is pretty cool, I kind of like, something fun to play with. Be very careful with the live blade on this one. It's like quick draw. 
that from this position, I just slide my finger out as I push it. I slide the sword out, flip it over in my hand. Once more done to the side, I just take it out, flip, and in my hand. Ready to fight or do whatever I need to do. Another drill that has to be done with the body itself, it's much more advanced form, is being able to take and turn the sword along the back so that I take and turn the blade over, taking the hand, turning the sword blade around, pulling the scabbard, coming down, striking. So from a front view, I would be taking, moving the sword blade around to the opposite hand. I have to turn blade up, around, so it's cutting from the side, pulling down the scabbard, moving my body, pulling out the cut. Just an advanced form of drawing skills. There are many, 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 many more ways. You want to practice on putting this blade in. This is very, very important in taking it out, which you'll probably get to do thousands of times if you practice drawing skills. Make sure that first you practice with a blade that does not have what I call a live blade or does not have an edge or a cutting edge on the blade. This is very important in the beginning to practice. This saves lots and lots of injuries. Because sometimes the sword goes out and you go, ah, I want to grab it. You can naturally, with that natural reaction, may end up cutting yourself, especially against a real live blade. Also another note on real live blades that are very nice blade, you do not, that you're using for cutting which I don't really expect at all until you get a little bit more advanced in your training. But sword cutting is really fun. We will show you a few sword cuts. That this, <coughs> excuse me, this uh, blade itself, you do not want to get oils and stuff, natural oils and stuff on the blade. You actually can cause damage to your blade and it can rust. So you want to keep it as clean as possible. There are many ways to clean it. There's a lot of good books that have information or ask your sensei about how to keep your blade clean, especially if you have a very nice one. And this is how he holds his body tight. 
angulation to the tree. Coming down using his feet to dig in, holding on with his hands. Notice how he holds his body tight, angulation to the tree. Coming down using his feet to dig in, holding on with his hands. To be able to climb up to higher surfaces which you can't reach or jump up and grab. In this case, I'm going to take off my belt and use my belt to help to get the higher surfaces. Take it off, throw it over the top, grab hold. You can tie a knot in it or just hold both ends. Then you're up.
Coming back down. Hold on tight. Use your feet. One of the most important aspects of our art is that of self-reliance. You will learn to be confident in any situation, to overcome any obstacle that should come up in your life, whether it's an assailant or just a bad day at work. An important thing is to know how to survive. Say you're going on vacation, you're going to death, you're driving through Death Valley. Suddenly your car breaks down, you're stranded. Do you know what to do to survive? Are you prepared to survive? One of the key elements to any outdoor survival situation is being prepared. Just like being prepared is the key to an encounter with a mugger or somebody who would want to do harm to you. If you're prepared, you can handle the situation. The same holds true in survival situations. If you had been prepared when you took your trip and you realized that it was taking you through the desert, you would have gotten water, maybe a poncho or a blanket or even a tent, something to make shelter so that you would have shade and be protected from the hot sun. You'd also have maybe some food, maybe a signal mirror or a CB radio so that you could contact somebody and get help. Knowing how to survive in different climates is very important. There are a number of classes you can take to help you with this. Um, one of the things that I suggest that you do is learn a little bit of first aid so that you are prepared should you become injured and have to survive outdoors. Another thing is whenever you're going into an environment, make a survival kit for that environment. As I was saying, you would have been prepared had you gone into the desert. You would have had certain items. The same holds true anywhere you're going to go. Think about what can happen and what you would need if those things happen. A couple of the aspects that I would like you to work on in second cue to help build your awareness. Awareness of how you operate your daily life and also what you do in times when you don't think that you're quite awake. And that's during your dreams. All of us dream at night. Some of us are aware of our dreams, some of us are not. I'd like you to begin to get yourself a journal. And in that journal I'd like you to write down dreams that you have every night. If you do not have conscious awareness of your dreams, the way to start learning to do that is to keep your journal and a pen by your bedside. Before you go to sleep, right before you start to drift off all the way to sleep, I want you to tell yourself that I'd like to have or I want to have three dreams. And in those three dreams, I want to be able to take and to write them down. It doesn't matter if I write them down or consciously aware in the morning or if I wake up in the middle of the night, write them down and go back to sleep. I want you to record those dreams and you'll begin to see a pattern inside those dreams. You can also ask these dreams to be able to teach you things that are important and imperative in your life. There have been many, many, many major discoveries that have been gotten in dream states that have allowed us to live our lives with lights and things like sewing machines and cotton gins and many things like that that have come from a dream state. It's that natural function of the mind. You spend a lot of time when you're not awake, so maybe you can learn to utilize that, maybe to enhance your life, to give you kind of answers to things that maybe you don't know the answer to yet. You can ask for a higher essence or a higher source from whatever religion that you believe in to help guide you, to give you this kind of information, to guide your own personal spiritual growth. I want you to study the different aspects of what the different religions and things mean. This is important so that you have an understanding to enhance whatever spiritual path that you have chosen for yourself. Make it the best. Make it the, the most intense for yourself in a way that it creates a, a complete bonding of who and what you are, no matter what your religion is. Be open to the aspect to allow another human being to have whatever beliefs that they also choose. It's also their right to choose what they want to. It's time for all of us to recognize each other as all humans that are living on this planet together, it's tough for us to understand all the dimensions that exist besides just our own physical makeup. So begin to write down even your physical things of occurrences and things that happen in your life that may be important to you. Writing these things down as well as notes on each of the things that you learn in your training and your discoveries so 
So you can build a system to where that you can help and share this information with others.